from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi, welcome back from lunch. It's good to see everyone. This is a nice, nice crowd for me. This is like, this feels like home. Just good data nerds everywhere. Oh, uh, let's see. I'm going to start with a short reading. It's about two minutes long. You're going to wonder why the hell I'm doing this, and later it will become clear. It is the raccoon history of New York City from the perspective of a disgruntled immortal raccoon based on New York Times searches. We have been here longer. I'm a raccoon. <laughs> we have been here longer than you have. We dipped our paws in the spring on Spring Street. We climbed the trees in the forests of Lower Manhattan. We laughed in the moonlight and ate beautiful dinners of blackberries and ladybugs. And you came and you stayed and you built houses. Fine. We're small. We will make room. You made muffins. We ate the crumbs. Everyone was happy. But not for long because you wanted coats. So we went into exile upstate. For hundreds of years, we kept to ourselves, sneaking garbage at night, the occasional bit of lettuce or baked beans, or on a good night, baked goods. Our fur was always in style, and it was a hard life, but we lived on our love and our wits. And then, in the 1970s, there was a fur boom, and I was sure that was the end of us. But thank God, finally, finally, we went out of fashion. And people began to realize that we, the raccoons, had a right to be there. They stood up for us. In 1982, a woman named, uh, 1982, a meeting was held in Scarsdale. Have we no decency in this town? Asked a lady named Rita. Raccoons are bright, lovable creatures. Do we want our children to walk by their carcasses? No, Rita, we don't. But you see what was happening? We weren't just getting into your garbage. We were getting into your hearts. A word on rabies. Now listen, I'm first to admit that rabies is a problem in our community. But let me tell you a story. It was 1998 in Woodstock, New York. Lots of places sell baked goods there. Great town, very open-minded. And we thought we could trust the humans. So this one raccoon, a little guy, had a good thing going with a woman named Barbara. She gave him treats. It was a backyard thing, and you know how those go. But it wasn't enough for Barbara. One day she trapped him and took him, it's tough to talk about this, took him to the local daycare, where she introduced this tiny little raccoon to all the children, and the raccoon cuddled with everyone, 14 toddlers, 10 adults. Beautiful, right? But when it turned out that all 24 humans had been exposed to rabies, who was blamed? Not Barbara. Who was shot in cold blood and buried by Barbara's husband? Not Barbara. Who had his little body dug up by the Department of Health? Not Barbara. Let me tell you the name they gave that raccoon. Are you ready? The name the humans gave that raccoon in, the, in 1998 was Spartacus. That's the truth. The leader of the slave revolt. You can read it in the, arc, in the article in the paper of record. Who's to blame here? The raccoon doing its best or the society that only accepts cuteness? Now look, we always wanted to come back to the city. This is our home. In 1984, a single raccoon sighting in Midtown was enough to make the New York Times. But, and let me ask you, if you don't want raccoons, why would you build an ornamental goldfish pond on 51st Street? <laughs> By 2002, we'd made it to the Bronx, for real. And over the last 15 years, we found our way back to the city, to all the boroughs. Today you'll find us everywhere, and we've actually taken over Brooklyn. We've returned. Our trees and streams are gone, but we make the best of what's there. And you call us trash pandas. It's doubly insulting. Let me take the second word first. Pandas, overrated. Their, their ecological niche is five inches wide, and if you don't serve them fresh bamboo prepared just so, they fall over and die. Imagine a panda finding its way down the FDR to Midtown. But also that first word, trash. Let me ask, is it so wrong that we want what you throw away? Your spare shishitos, risotto dollops, your blue sky bakery muffin chunks. I live from your artisanal leavings. Your trash is my gold. Why not treasure, panda? <laughs> and remember, we are not your guests. You are the guests of the raccoons. 
So the reason for that will become clear momentarily. Uh, we got through the raccoon portion of the talk. <laughs> and now I'm going to make some observations about a life spent uh, lived between media and archives, and then do a very brief software demo, like a minute, and then issue some recommendations to the assembled audience, because it's not often that I get you all here together, and I'm kind of excited to tell you what I need uh, and ask for your help. So in 2006, 2005, I was a writer, and I was doing okay, and I got a job at Harper's Magazine in charge of their website. I was also kind of a programmer, just one of those people who did a couple different things kind of poorly. And Harper's being cheap was like, well, this will do, and brought me on. And uh, I'll get a good example of what it was like to work there was the publisher took me aside, and I was like, I think we should put some articles from the magazine on the internet. And his response was, you are like McNamara getting me further into the Vietnam of the World Wide Web. Um, which literally tells you everything you need to know. And, uh, and so after, after, there wasn't any Wikipedia, so I just had to like make do with that, that analogy. And, uh, but given no money, given lots of time, uh, and given um, uh, sort of the resources at hand, I realized this magazine had gone back to 1850, and also, there was this sort of white elephant bibliography that they'd built. They built it during the days when uh, they were going to like make it and then sell terminals to research libraries for tens of thousands of dollars a year so that people could walk to the stacks and go get the magazines off the stacks going back to 1850. And it was, everything was beautiful and, and sorted with LOC subject headings and on and on. And of course, it had gone terribly uh, over schedule. And so they'd started in like 89 or 90, and now it was 95, and nobody, everybody wanted pictures. So now, 10 years later, I show up, and I'm like, this thing is great. Let's put some pictures with it. And they said, great, we'll give you um, 18 grand. And that includes your scanner. So I bought, uh, I did some experiments. I bought a Fujitsu 5750C. And I scanned the hell out of that archive. And we, tri I, uh, Making of America had gone 1850 to 1900 uh, out of Cornell and other places. So I traded them a hard drive with like Harper's up to 1923, uh, up to the public domain line, and you know gave them some bibliographic data. They gave me. It was just this insane horse trading with no money. Uh, in which I was doing all the programming, all the scanning, or most of the scanning. I had a high school student who um, was terrible, actually. I should have just done all of it. And um, no, it's in the 70s, there's like all these little bad cuts on the spine because he wasn't paying attention. Anyway, um, got it down to like seven cents a page, put it up, and then suddenly everybody was really nice to me. And they'd been yelling at me before. I, I was a cost center. But what it turns out is that it's like it's very expensive to get someone to subscribe to a magazine, often 20, 30, up to 100 bucks to get somebody to subscribe to a magazine that they might pay $20 for. And the reason that uh, it's worth it to pay that is because advertising is what really funds the publication. And so what I had done, all of a sudden, all these subscriptions came in because people like archives. They, they don't like them. Uh, they liked subscribing, but the idea of getting everything back to 1850 was very motivating. And so. Um, suddenly, instead of having to spend 35 bucks, you were getting these digital uh, subscribers who were just showing up. And they were really nice to me for a couple of months. They were really happy I was there. Because I wasn't making the money with the archive, but I was saving them money. And the reason you need uh, to keep your circulation up is that advertisers buy by number, and it's audited. So it's like if you're at a quarter million, you have to spend all the money in the world to keep at a quarter million, or your whole business model implodes. So that's one big interaction between archives and, uh, and the media that I can share with you. Also, that whole time I was ashamed because I would go to like the Library of Congress website and other sites which had standards for, for scanning and it would be like only, you know, 96-bit uncompressed TIFFs are acceptable ever. And I had one, you know, a couple hard drives and no money and I was like, you know, I, I, I just sort of made a decision that if I could see the grain of the paper um, that that was okay. Uh, but no one backed me up on that. And so I built this archive that was good, that ended up being resold to lots of university libraries and was fine. But the whole time I did it, I was like, I don't know what the right angle of pages is, and I don't know what the tolerances truly are. Because with the standards that are published are incredibly high. They're just, in, you know, they're not intended for amateurs with no budgets. But that's, that was the real world I was in to get this asset 
online. Also, I scored a whole copy of the archive from Bennington. They, uh, somebody drove down from Vermont in a Toyota and just gave me all of Harper's um, because they wanted digital access. So that's how that got done, right? It's a completely no grant, no process, no good standards, no clear understanding, and yet it got done. Um, also, once I got it out there, people immediately came in and started to threaten lawsuits. The number one job of an editor is not to make things beautiful or to make the prose great, it's to avoid litigation. Putting, <laughs> putting all these things online uh, meant that people who had forgotten about that unfortunate incident in 1995 uh, suddenly were back and were angry that it had found its way onto the web again. So just something worth noting. Um, my microphone is falling off, so let's, we'll, we'll see how it goes. And. Uh, then I left there, I worked for a big consulting, or a small media consulting firm that gave me lots of access to um, big media companies. I built a, a version of Gourmet Magazine for the iPad, which, many things aside, it was based on archives from, from Gourmet. And I learned um, a thing that was very important that I, I will continue to talk about, which is asset panic. Unless you have the assets in your hand, and you can't believe how many people will tell you, like, no worries, I'm going to go get you a hard drive with all that stuff. Don't worry, it's fine. And like four months goes by, and they're like, actually, there's 12 lawyers involved now. I don't know how the hell it happened. Um, <laughs> old things increase risk in an organization, and APIs and archives are territories. People are very fiercely dependent, uh, def uh, defendant around them. And so I learned to navigate and deal with that. That's another reality in this world. So that's my advice to anyone if you ever end up in the private sector working on archives. Panic. Just constantly, frequently, never stop panicking until you have full control over all the assets and have them in a digital form that you can manipulate. Then, as mentioned in my intro, very graciously, uh, I wrote this thing in, uh, a couple years ago called What is Code for Bloomberg Business Week, and they basically said, here, take the whole issue of the magazine and... Uh, and write about code, do anything you want, go crazy, have fun. And it was terrifying. Like they were just literally were like, hey, we're gonna give you the whole issue. And I went and hid under a blanket and my wife laughed at me. Uh, <laughs> and I moaned because I knew that everyone was gonna yell at me. There's no way you do something like this and programmers don't come scream at you. But the, the key thing is that we talk about this and we talk about me, the writer, I did it. A hundred people worked on this, like at least. And even more so, um, I wanna come back to this point, but there was a, a GitHub repository, so after it was published, it went out and people continued to correct it. So probably 200 people had their hands on this thing. And all of the, some of their work is tracked, some of it isn't. But what we just do culturally is just like, oh, Paul Ford wrote this thing, which is great for me, I love it, seriously. Like, it's, it's fantastic, my ego is constantly gratified. But it's gratified based on lies. So I live with it. I live with it and I do okay. But, <laughs> The writing process is stochastic. It's not this like nice, clear, delineated thing where there's versions and there's just crap flying everywhere and everyone's putting stuff off until the last minute and nobody knows what the hell's going on. Uh, last little stage of my life, I decided I would start a business with my uh, with a co-founder, a guy named Rich Ziotti, and it was we're building just we're a digital product studio. We build apps and websites in New York City, and I was like, this is it. Done with archives for a while, probably done with the cultural sector. Let's make a little money, go work for banks. But they find you. You can't get away. Um, archives can't be escaped. Um, I can't even talk about half the work, but like a, a big NGO came. I ended up, I, I'm like on the phone for an hour and a half talking with Nara. And uh, Nara loves conference calls. Like, I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but. Whew. And uh, so. <laughs> A lot of conference calls, a lot of like what asset goes here and what asset goes there. And uh, so no matter what you do, uh, you deal with archives. And what I realized is that all large software problems kind of are legacy problems. And, and archive is kind of a nice way to say legacy. Like the cultural sector dealing with big archives is actually not that different from going to some company and they have, you know, five terabytes of information and user records and all kinds of things that they need to make sense of. So in some ways there, the problem space is, is kind of similar. Um, so I'm going to do a quick software demo as I now try to take everything I just told you and synthesize it. A couple more things to know about me. I love timelines. Timelines are great. They're beautiful. I don't, you know, many of the speakers have talked about timelines. I'm going to tell you something about timelines. This one's great. Oh, yeah, that one is from the Washington Post. 
This is, uh, oh, wait, where we go? Boop. Oh, boy, everything's going, nothing's going my way. Let me see if I can go backwards. There we go. Um, so timelines are great. Timelines are terrible interfaces, by the way. There we go. This is all, all humanity. Timelines always seem like a good idea, and I'm now like five or six years in, and it built a bunch, and they, they never actually solve a problem, but they look cool. Sometimes they kind of do. It hurts. It really stings. I want to believe in timelines so bad, so bad, but I can't. Um, I'm also three years late in a book. This is just kind of the confession part. I just want to share this with you. Because <laughs> why would a guy who has a software company and, and is a writer go and build software? Well, it's because he doesn't want to write something. Um, these are all the things I've done to avoid the book. <laughs> I agreed to give this talk. That's one. Create experimental websites. Learn two new computer languages. Rent in an office. A lot of coffee stuff. I got into coffee, got out of coffee. I got some cushions, some nice cushions. I bought a whiteboard. I wrote software to manage my anxiety about writing the book. I wrote that Business Week piece. That's actually kind of was supposed to be from the book, but then I did that instead. A lot of Medium posts, um, co-founded a company. But there's one in here I wrote and then abandoned this book writing. Because, you know, when you're supposed to write a book, the first thing you do is write a CMS to manage the book. And um, <laughs> so I did this, like, three, four years ago, I wrote this CMS. And I kind of got it like 30, 40, 50% of the way there. And I was like, eh, and then I gave up on that. So I had like two things. Have you ever nested your procrastination? It's actually really interesting. Because then, <laughs> then you're like, do I have to, do I just stop and finish the book? Or should I like back out from, like, you know, to the thing? I'm like now so far in. Like, should I clean the office and then finish the CMS and then write the book? So turns out I remain blocked. So, um, and... Uh, and, and I'm still blocked. I'm still kind of working through that. There's a third thing that goes into this software demo, which is that media is having a really bad time. Um, nobody trusts it. It's, uh, you know, like 72% of people kind of trust National News Org, but only 20% trust it a lot. And I mean, you saw Rachel here earlier. Like, she's working hard. She's getting a lot of statistics all lined up and working with journalists to try to get things as factual as possible for the New York Times. The people who work in that field are very disciplined and very serious. And it sucks that the world doesn't trust them. Like it just is sad and it's tough and it's bad marketing and it's, it's bad politics and, and it, it's, uh, it's a situation. And then also, uh, sorry to, to go back to the times, but um, editors and copywriters and fact checkers are getting laid off everywhere. That's just a reality. It's been a reality for five, 10 years now. Uh, there's just less and less money for them, less and less money for content production. And so they're going. Um, and then there's a huge discussion around fake news, and that is, I'm not going to recapitulate, you're, you're all living it, but there's this sense of, of news being arbitrary and journalism being arbitrary. Um, and uh, writers, in my opinion, are learning less and less good practice because they have fewer and fewer people to keep an eye on them. Um, and so my solution to this was to build a timeline for which I apologize. Um, and it has all the regular timeline things. You give it events, and the events have date stamps on them, and it arranges them. And then here's a little video of those things moving around. And you can click on the date and zoom out and see different contexts. And uh, this is all powered by an API with a nice JavaScript front end. And I, I knew as I was doing this that timelines aren't the answer, but I couldn't help myself. These are all events from Wikipedia, events from all over. and. Um, all kinds of different sources. And so, um, yeah, I've gone out to the 1800s. You can zoom back in. And then underneath all of that, what you can do is just sort of bookmark the events. And they kind of go into this pile of stuff on the right. And then you add notes to the bookmarks. And that turns into an essay. So what's nice about that is you're keeping your sources uh, connected to the things that you're writing. And then you can kind of rearrange these little blocks of text. And it looks like it might be easy or not easy. It's actually kind of a great way to write if you are like me and you're getting older and you don't trust your memory as much and you don't ha can't count on fact checkers uh, in the way that you used to. It keeps everything you do connected to, uh, to what you're writing. And so some of those cultural problems that are emerging are very much on my mind. And I feel that a lot of the software, we built CMSs at my company. I built more CMSs than I'd like to admit uh, in my life. But 
you give people a text box and then you move on. And I feel that the text boxes need to get smarter. They need to do more work. Um, and so here's an example of how I wrote that raccoon piece. I, did a, I imported a ton of New York Times and other uh, search results, some of the Cooper Hewitt collection, which actually didn't have a lot of raccoon-based information, but still was cool. Um, <laughs> searched for raccoon, and it made a timeline as a result, looked around, read some raccoon articles, and then started to write factually-based, slightly funny raccoon prose. Okay, so that piece exists because I built my system and I wanted to test it out. So that's just a, something to think about, like there's some continuity there. So anyway, that's on scroll. Here's what I have really learned from, from building that and doing that. I want to get to about a terabyte of metadata in that thing. It's probably at like 50, 100 megabytes right now. There's a lot of, maybe a little more if you count images. And, uh, I want to get as much cultural information in as events as I possibly can over the next, let's say, year or so. And to be clear, what I showed you, it's a personal side project. I built that thing. I'm using it to write. It actually has really helped unblock me on the book. Um, and uh, because it, it turns out that there's a great quote, quote from Joyce Carol Oates that uh, writer's block is, is, is related to the writer's sense of their own fraudulence. And what this does is it keeps you from feeling like a fraud. You know, you're just like, all right, there's an event. I wrote a little note about it. I wrote another note. And suddenly you're writing an essay. And that is actually very good at, at taking away the block that you get when you have a pile of books on one side and a blank screen on the other. So this is what the world looks like a little bit around uh, cultural archives that are open and can be imported. You've got, I won't even explain this chart because you all live it. But I've been through all of it. I love XML, I love XSLT, I love RDF, I love CSV, I love UTF-8 data, um, I don't love web services and SOAP, but like, I'm mixed on Mets. But like, there's JSON. This is how stuff comes out. This is what you get today. And it's really freaking hard to work with, all of it. And I've worked with all of it, and I'm good at working with all of it. I'm like 20 years in. I, I photocopied the, SGML ISO standard at a college library after getting it through interlibrary loan, all 900 pages of it because I saw it as wonderful secret lore when I was 20 years old, which is, don't, that doesn't leave the room, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, really, <laughs> but, but it, I mean, I love this stuff, but it's also just kind of increasingly hard, to, it's intractable to work with when you're trying to really explore and understand a data set or import it in bulk into an other view. And so, you know, I've been, I'll, t I'll talk through some of the ones I looked at. Cooper Hewitt, amazing. It's all on GitHub, links to images, fantastic. Actually kind of hard because it's zillions of files. Very hard, you have to import it somewhere and then search through it. Uh, Met, giant CSV file, hard to work with. Has, you can't, it doesn't directly link to images. It has a sort of interstitial ID. It's so, um, but I need pictures. I love pictures. Everyone who works in media needs pictures to make their thing useful. My timeline kind of sucks and isn't exciting for me to use unless it has pictures. So then am I spidering every web page in order to figure out what the image is? Um, all that sort of stuff comes up because the CSV doesn't include uh, images. This is me, by the way, criticizing the commons. Just me saying, hey, thanks for all the incredible things you give me for free and your really hard work. Let me tell you why I hate it. Um, I'm mindful of that. This stuff is a gift. This API is, again, wonderful and terrible. Um, kind of great to work with, slow, just doesn't always, you just, it's hard to know where you are. This thing is horrible. <laughs> Just, when you get into the XML on this bad boy, it is just an endless nightmare of pain, and it, there's no way around it. Like, Wikipedia is hard to work with the raw data. There's DBpedia, there's all these other, I mean, there's so many projects to deal with the fact that Wikipedia uh, data is tough to work with that it's, I can't even list them. Um, 25 million mark records, which, <laughs> thanks, and also thanks. Um, <laughs> right, I mean, there, they're great, and I started messing around with them. I got Pymark. I started fooling around and just like doing everything I could, but they're hard to work with, right? They're, they're from a specific world. Uh, gorgeous API. Chronicling of America actually has one of the nicest designed, commons-driven, like public APIs I've ever seen. Hierarchy is incredibly clear. I want to spider the whole damn thing and just know everything that's in there. And uh, 
Uh, there's no simple way to do that aside from writing a web, writing a web spider and then s sort of mapping it to my schema. And so I think there's this tension going on between archive and access um, with how things are actually working. And I think that we've cut things up. Like right now, I think the, the consensus is a great open API is enough. And it, for God's sake, it is. Like it's a wonderful thing. Um, but I'm going to mention something that we don't like to talk about very much in our community, which is uh, relational databases in SQL which are everywhere. This is the data language of the universe. This is how people store and retrieve data, is through SQL databases. And this little guy, um, SQLite is entirely public domain. It's on all of your phones. It's on Android, it's on, on iOS. It's built in everywhere. It comes as part of Python. It is a 150K SQL database that kind of runs the world, and it's so powerful and un, um, unassuming that nobody really talks about it. But if you could start putting all of your data into SQLite databases and making those available, then I could download them and I could start searching and exploring it without having to put it anywhere in like five seconds. Like I could start hacking and messing with uh, public corpora in the time it took to download. Because once you get in and you type SQLite database name, you're good to go. You can even turn on full text search. It's public domain. It's all UTF-8 and or UTF-16 by default, um, et cetera, et cetera. It actually hits all the sweet spots that we usually talk about. It just doesn't talk about them in the way that we usually talk about them. Um, also, if you could make them tournable, my god, that would be great. I know that may be really hard for an organization, a large cultural organization. Uh, you could just take your SQLite file. And I'm, by the way, I'm not saying get rid of your API. I'm not saying get rid of your CSVs. I'm just saying, like, do this other thing too. Or suggest to someone else, even like me, to go and do it for you. If you point to the thing, if you say, like, hey, we didn't do this, but if you want to torrent everything as a SQLite database, go, it's over here, that's fantastic. Like, a little bit of institutional imprimatur just saying, like, that's at least semi-official is a really, really powerful signal. I can't tell you enough because there's all these, like, Wikipedia is a great example. There's 8 million extracting data from Wikipedia um, projects. None of them are particularly blessed. I guess there's like Semantic Media Wiki and a few others that, that have more involvement with the foundation, but you just don't know where to start. And like, if I could just get this, if I can click download the torrent, I will start messing with and incorporating your corpora into my historical writing tool within hours, and I will make sure that every single one of those boxes has a clear link back for accreditation back to your organization. Like, I will absolutely want to do that. Um, if you give me an API or a CSV, you've added sometimes months of work to that process. So again, supplement, not replace. I'm not asking people to um, replace what they are with this format, but some sort of commons format that I could immediately start ma manipulating would be fantastic. Uh, leave the original record, even put it into SQLite. Like, you don't have to throw away the past. I know that's really hard to do culturally to throw away old records. Don't, just leave them there. Um, assume storage is free, assume bandwidth is free. I can download, I have a 10 terabyte drive at home to work with this. I mean, I spent like $1,000 on a really, really powerful machine and I have very fast internet and that's just me at home in Brooklyn. It's not, that's, that's the entirety of, of money invested into Unscroll so far. Um, and also images, anything you can do to be visual with your corpora, it makes it easier for me to hack with, explore, and put them into other contexts. It's such a powerful signal. Um, and again, yeah, if you can't do, just point, just say like, hey, this looks legit. We're happy that they put it in the SQLite. Good job. Because I know that culturally it can be hard to do new things um, with your data. So that's my big ask. Um, going back to where we were, I think there are sort of two main fallacies of archives. The publishers believe they're free content and that you can just sort of use them over and over again and, and find value in the past that can be easily exposed. It can't, not without a lot of human work to add context and meaning, which is what everyone who has been up here today has essentially emphasized. It's an unbelievable amount of labor to get value and meaning and news out of archives. Um, I try to correct the publishers on this and they get really sad. They're like, oh, we want to build an archive of our wonderful publication. And 
And I'm like, well, <laughs> let me tell you what that will take. And then like 10 minutes later, they asked me to leave the room. Um, the archivist fallacy is a little bit that news is an archive waiting to happen. That's not real either. There's all sorts of things that are going on around how media is produced. And so what I'm trying to do here is just see if software can help resolve that gap. And the number one guinea pig right now for me is me as a writer and a journalist um, supposed to be doing more, oops, supposed to be doing, well, that's right. Uh, <laughs> supposed to be doing more work for Business Week right now. And, and of course, I'm procrastinating on that too. But I am using the tool uh, and it's very productive. I, uh, I'm going to try to open it really soon. I'm just a little nervous about API security, but um, and I'm going to, uh, you know, pretty soon I'll have probably a couple million events on it. So, but I think that there's an opportunity for uh, things like this. And this is just a hypothesis. I don't. This is not a hill I'm dying on. This product. This is something I'm really wanted to see in the world, and I wanted to resolve some of my own anxiety about facts and and sort of what what archives can do. But uh, I think there's you know, just watching the talks today, there's been uh, 20 different angles on this exact same situation. So, um, but I could really use the help in, in just sort of easily importable data. I have lots of ideas for what you can do with your date and time fields, uh, including ones that are, you know, 20 years old and mark and have lots of ASCII characters in them and are pretty wacky. I totally can help you. Just let me know. I have a strategy. Um, so that's, that's where I'm at. And I just wanted to show that to you. Thank you all very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.